back into reopening. We've seen a wide range of stages for organisations um, reopening. Some haven't yet, and many have, but also some have been open for several weeks now as well as we move forward into August. Today, we are joined by Rich and Rhiannon, who will be sharing their experiences. Rich at um, Soldiers of Shropshire Museum has reopened, I believe, last week, if I'm correct, and Rhiannon at Zedazawa opened up several weeks ago. So, two very different perspectives today. So, thank you both of you for coming along today. Um, if we start with Rich, um, as you've just just reopened, how, how have you found the reopening process for you, for you and your volunteer team? Um, it's not been difficult. Uh, I think we feared more than uh, actually materialized. Um, and it's a case of doing everything, you know, really step by step, dealing with what you do know. Um, there's absolutely no way everyone can know how people are going to be, how they're going to react. We just don't know all of that. So step by step, one thing at a time, deal with the known uh, and, and try a few things out. Um, we found our visitors have been compliant, polite, grateful. Um, so there haven't been any of the issues around what if people don't want to sanitise, what if people don't want to give their name. So far, it's all worked really well. Um, I think you have to be prepared to press the pause button um, if things seem to be running out of hand um, and rewind if necessary, reset. Um, but we all know what we're doing. We all, all of us here, it, it's it's all sensible, common sense stuff. There's There's nothing um there's no smoke and mirrors it, it's all about how we look after ourselves and our colleagues and our volunteers um i would thoroughly recommend everybody read and uh, almost on a weekly basis read the nmbt guidance on on covid it changes as quickly as the law seems to change now um it is very similar to the dcms the nmbt is the national museum directors council um, and uh, it's it's written and, and produced in a way that, that really means something to us in museums so it's, uh, and, and, and heritage settings. So it's, it's a really useful thing to keep on top of. Once you know what those boundaries and what those rules and, and things are, you've got space to flex um, according to your own. The new lockdown in Manchester, meaning an extension to, um, you know, not being able to be open for, for the museums there. And I think we need to we need to keep an eye on what's happening from our own plans in, in case we have to stop dead in our tracks again. Um, but I, I, if we can anticipate what's coming, um, then we're in a much better place to react and to react with our whole teams. Um, so yes, yeah, so to, to, in brief, take it step by step, be prepared to flex, learn and listen and adapt and anticipate what's coming down the line. You're on mute, Will. Brilliant. Thank you, Rich. Thank you for sharing how, how you've been getting on. Um, sorry about any technical difficulties. I appear to have just lost the internet, so I've just been trying to scrap, trying to get back in. Um, thank you anyway. Um, with your redeployment, Rich, how have you found the communication to volunteers? And um, now that you have reopened, as you mentioned, people so far are generally following, following the rules. Has that eased any of the, a lot of the stresses which were there in the volunteers? Um, volunteers haven't been particularly stressed. I know there are some that aren't keen to come back. They are in a more vulnerable group. Um, but the activities they were doing would have brought them into quite close proximity with each other anyway. So that's those activities are sort of slid down the, 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 the scale of priority. Um, I, think, I think everyone involved with the museum, trustees, um, other local partnerships, have been pleased with how it has opened and how it has sort of progressed. So yes, it should inspire confidence in everyone, and it's um, 
like I said at the beginning, it, it's nowhere near as terrifying as as you might think when you're when you're planning. Um, in terms of how I've communicated, a very small team of volunteers comparatively. Uh, so WhatsApp has worked very very well for me. Everyone signed up to to that, and a couple of Facebook messages um, for for some of the others, um, and uh, a really good response. People have volunteers are very positive for the museum's progress before they're positive about their return so i think they're glad that things are moving um, and there are opportunities and they're a very patient bunch up into bits brilliant thank thank you richard and before we go into any more questions i'd just like to introduce rhiannon who has been um leading volunteers returning at zsl hi rhiannon how have how has redeployment gone you've been um there several weeks now since reopening how how has it has it become some kind of normality now? No. <laughs> the normality changes week by week, a bit like life, to be honest. Yeah, so just to context for um, those of you who don't know, so we, uh, ZSL is London and Whipsnade Zoos we're talking about generally. Uh, so we're two quite big sites. Um, and we were allowed to reopen from the 15th of June. So we've been reopened now for six weeks or more. Um, and what I'm going to say is actually probably... Uh, contrary to all, a lot of what Matt said, um, we were given five days notice uh, to reopen. Uh, so all of the wonderful planning that Matt did, I did very, very quickly, of which there are many learnings, many mistakes, I'm sure, uh, but we did open and we did have volunteers in on day one uh, at both sites. Now, um, the one thing I would sort of say, being zoos, um, the big um, issue for us was that putting in social distancing measures across our sites was easy enough, we're outdoor, um, but what we don't have is a raft of gallery attendants, visitor hosts that you all have already within your organisations. So having people across the site to support with wayfinding um, around new directionality and uh, encouraging people to social distance was a layer of uh, staffing that we just didn't have a precedent for. So um, for us, from day one, it was quite important to have volunteers back to support with that visitor journey and um, help people to feel comfortable and relaxed in the surroundings, but also aware of what uh, the new rules were on site. So that's why we got volunteers back from day one. Obviously, all of the, uh, the great stuff that, that Matt and Rich, um, etc. said about choice um, still existed for us. It was uh, absolutely the choice of volunteers, whether they wanted to come back. Um, but I did sort of obviously emphasise how incredibly helpful it would be for anyone who did want to come back uh, for us. So we prioritised operational roles when we reopened back in June uh, because we needed to basically open the doors, get some cash flow coming back through the organisation, but we needed to do it safely and comfortably. So we only brought back minimal volunteering roles that were going to help with those elements. Um, we didn't have a volunteer role, as I said, that helped with that sort of very basic visitor um, experience on site. So we um, pulled that together quite last minute. One of our sites, we had a precursor for that. So we adapted that role. And in the other site, we had to bring it, um, bring it alive um, anew for the 15th of June. So um, essentially, volunteers were signing up to help in a new role. And what was really lovely about that though was a lot of people wanted to come and help ZSL. We hadn't been quiet in talking about how financially unstable we were as a result of COVID. So there are a lot of volunteers from different sections of the society who wanted to come and lend a hand. So we've had volunteers who normally would help with um, animal care duties, help in the library, help in one site, uh, have now moved to another site to help in these operational roles. So that's been a really nice, a team spirit, I think, and everyone who's come on site has very much been part of that sort of mucking in, uh, taking part culture. Um, in advance of coming back, obviously we didn't have a huge amount of time to do loads of training and welcome back sessions, I'd have loved to, uh, but what we did do was we put out a quite comprehensive, if anyone knows how I write, then they know that I write comprehensively, a comprehensive redeployment fact sheet, which basically answered how we were going to do it, who we were prioritising and why we were doing that. Because basically 
I didn't have time when we first opened to um, support all of those that might have underlying health conditions or individual anxieties. I'm being really blatantly obvious, uh, uh, honest with you guys now. Didn't have the time, unfortunately, to go through all of that individually with people. So I had to be really honest and I had to say, look, we have to bring back the really low risk, those that feel quite comfortable to give it a go. Um, and then we will work with those that feel perhaps less happy or less able to come back immediately over the coming weeks. And that's what we did. So we asked volunteers, a little bit like the flow chart you saw earlier, we asked volunteers to um, self-declare um, within three categories that we uh, created, a low, medium and high risk um, based on NHS guidance, based on um, the risk assessments for our two sites and based on the known risks that we have between animals and um, humans and the affections. So for us, that was quite easy. So everyone who um, uh, declared themselves to be low risk, if they were happy to give the volunteer role a go, um, we were able to uh, get them in. We did run some um, welcome back sessions in the first few weeks for those first tranches of volunteers who came in, but that was backed up with quite a comprehensive set of um, notes risk assessment etc that uh, we ask volunteers to read in their own time to become familiar with um, yes I'm very happy to share the fact sheet with you uh, obviously it's out of date now but I'm happy to share that with you um, for us there's always uh, there was always going to be a, a balance between the organizational need to have certain um, uh, ZSL representatives on site at places where people could get confused with wayfinding and uh, not understand what we're asking of them um, and making sure that volunteers were safe to return and happy to return but that's been a constant balancing act ever since we opened really to ensure that the volunteers don't feel pressure to come back but also that they um, realize that we do need support. Um, the one downside I would say to the self-declaration form approach was an absolute nightmare of paperwork. I drowned under paperwork actually, but um, I did surface eventually. Um, the other thing I would say is we then started to get some of the moderate and the um, high risk groups back. And we did that by a one-to-one -one risk assessment. So we spoke to them individually about why it was that they'd labeled themselves in those groups, whether they felt happy to, to return, and if there were any further mitigations and safety measures we could put in place uh, for them in their specific role. Um, and that's how we've dealt with people. But we're still bringing people back now, um, six weeks later. So that slow, steady approach, definitely would agree with that from what Rich was saying. Challenges, very briefly before I shut up. Um, the operational reliance that we have on volunteers is always going to be quite a challenge for us because it means that we need to have a certain layer of volunteering on site. Um, but um, we are working ways around that now and actually it has had the unexpected positive of team working across the site being much more positive as a result because it's forced us to communicate um, there and then and work out what any issues might be. So that's been a really good positive. Um, the other challenge I found is volunteers who are at high risk but want to return ASAP and trying to persuade them just to wait a little bit. I find that quite challenging personally because I know they want to come back, they want to help, but I don't want them to be at risk. Um, we have needed greater numbers of volunteers because of the social distancing measures on site. So at the same time as bringing volunteers back, we launched a recruitment drive two weeks ago. Um, I'm now drive, <laughs> drowning under recruitment paperwork instead. Woohoo! Um, but that's also been really lovely because it's brought new energy into the organisation at a point where perhaps people were a bit unsure, COVID was going up a little bit, and actually that's been a real driver of energy in the organisation. Um, and the other challenge I would say that we've had is that, um, unlike you guys, obviously we're known as being outdoor institutions, but we actually have a lot of indoor spaces. And we've had volunteers who want to be selective about where they'll be stationed on site. That creates a, a rotor from hell actually so kind of tailoring it absolutely is essential but it will create lots more work so we have had to try and find happy mediums by I guess grading people into a limited number of variations rather than every variation under the sun if that makes sense that's a very quick potted um experience of mine thank you Rhiannon thank you for um 
for your de uh, going into a lot of detail about how you redeployed. I think you have to ask a lot of the questions which came up during during your talk, particularly around um, needing to recruit new volunteers. Um, good luck with the pro with the sifting through the thousands of applicants. Um, at least it's good to see so many people looking to apply to volunteer at this time as well on 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 the on that side as well. A um, couple of questions have come in today around certain factors around redeploying volunteers. Firstly, around the co how to have that conversation with volunteers, whether it's best to do it in person, by email, or allow a volunteer to self-lead. And secondly, around that conversation, what do you ask? How do you ask it? And how and how does GDPR play into it, um, which is a concern, I imagine, for a lot of organisations. Um, I'd be interested to hear from any of our speakers today or members of the group who, who have experience of it. These, I think these issues affect, affect all of us. Uh, yeah, happy to go. Um, I'm happy to share all of my forms. I think because I did this so early days, there are so many things that I would do differently, hindsight being that wonderful thing. Uh, we ran our self-declaration form past our legal team before we sent it out to volunteers just to get the, the say-so, but it very clearly set, states in there that this is going to be used purely to protect the volunteers on their return in the post-COVID COVID world, and when coronavirus is no longer an issue, those will be shredded and no longer be part of the volunteer paperwork. Um, and then in terms of sort of what we asked them, because some of the reasons that we weren't keen to have some groups back earlier were perhaps the age related factors that was a known risk, um, health conditions, we just asked them, why was it that you put yourself in that group? You know, are you happy to tell us a little bit more about the health condition that, um, that, that, that has put you in that group obviously they don't need to at all but actually most of our volunteers were very um happy to be quite honest and said you know i've got asthma it's very well controlled and actually a lot of that then ended up being a real formality in the vast majority of cases because it was well controlled within their volunteer role uh, which is outdoors in the main and where you can um you can socially distance from people very well many of the concerns that people might have had on such a big deal when we looked at the role itself so actually relating it back to the volunteer role and the conditions under which they'd be operating is really important as well brilliant thank you i think that's really useful information around asking because we do ask questions which would which are personal just normal volunteering and in these circumstances it's important to ensure the safety of those volunteers as as they continue to volunteer with us but i can understand how it is it is difficult subject to to deal with and all of us are going into a relative unknown in terms of bringing back volunteers. Was there any other speakers who wanted to share their experiences of collecting information? Um, I'll go very quickly. Um, in terms of GDPR, if you're upfront about why you're asking what you're asking and you're storing things safely, there isn't an issue. You're not, you're not using the information to tell everyone that so-and-so's got asthma. Um, you're not going to be turning this information into a pie chart to present to the directors in six time you're asking straightforward health questions in order to secure the health and safety of your volunteer team it, it, it shouldn't be a gdpr issue it shouldn't be um, a confidential issue because everybody collects this information and stores it properly and securely anyway so yeah um, i don't think people need to be too caught up on that um, i think keeping things simple is it's got a lot of attraction um to me and to, to a lot of people to you know be, be straightforward be straight up don't create yourselves lots of extra work where it's not required. Um, and, and just, you know, if you're honest and you're open and, and you're receptive, then that encourages your volunteers to do similar. Great. Thank you, Rich. Um, Matt, did you want to come in on this? Yeah, I can do. I mean, I, I fully agree with uh, with Rich and I saw Rihanna and, uh, putting her thumb up as well. And we've, I mean, we've been... Again, kind of upfront with everybody, we asked about it in the survey, so we started to get some of that information back. And when we ask volunteers, uh, so when we redeploy a role, 
we will ask volunteer we'll email volunteers um, asking them whether or not they want to return and if they do want to return they'll need to um, say which of the areas of clinical vulnerability they have so that when we've got that information and then we can conduct individual risk assessments um, with them that information is stored securely um, it's used as Richard said to make sure that those volunteers are safe but also that our, our, our other visitors are safe you know and everybody around them um, so it's really important we, we do this um, and actually if people won't supply us with that information then we're not prepared to take the risk as, of, as an organisation and allow them um, back to volunteer you know it's, it's hugely important that we look after our volunteers and make sure that they're safe when they're on site so yeah I had a it's not a GDPR issue. We, well, what I would say is we, we know we will destroy um, as soon as COVID-19 ends, uh, which will hopefully be soon, uh, we'll destroy all of that information. So we won't keep it any longer than is absolutely necessary. Brilliant. Thank you, Matt. Um, I've got a question for you, Rhiannon. Um, five days was quite a quick um, turnaround for you. Did you, um, was it, was it like, was it based on quite a pressure to generate income? Did you feel there was any leeway in that five days or were you sort of said you have to do it in five days? Yeah, really good question. I'm starting to type a response actually. Yeah, but I'm a very honest person. Um, a big driver for ZSL to get the doors of the zoos open was income we were hemorrhaging money. I think the difference, I guess, the main difference between uh, zoos and museums is that we were shelling out a lot of money for our living collection that still need to, need to be fed, watered and cared for during um, lockdown. So we were absolutely hemorrhaging money by this point. So yes, there was a huge amount of pressure to open on day one, uh, rightfully so. But also there is a huge um, effect on animals um, when they, for so long, um, have a certain way of life and then suddenly have no visitors and then um, so there was a sort of welfare angle actually to be getting visitors back on site so that the animals felt um, comfortable and assured in their venue so I don't want it to be purely seen as an in income thing it definitely was a, a welfare issue for the animals as well it was a tight turnaround and um, the one thing I should say is that we had already um, sent out a questionnaire to our volunteers like many of you guys have done to check if there would be volunteers who were happy to return so we knew there was a proportion of volunteers who were game to come in from day one um, the volunteer role is quite simple and straightforward and we knew it's quite a low risk one anyway so whilst we hadn't had it on site before we knew it wasn't going to be terribly difficult to get off the ground quickly um, so the self-declaration form all that did really was just make sure that we were bringing the lowest risk people on site from day one. And even then, if people came in on day one and thought, oh, actually, not quite sure, this feels a little bit unsure, people can change their minds. We were happy for them to say, actually, maybe this isn't quite for me right now. So I don't think it compromised um, the risk or the safety at all, uh, but we were quite cautious and we did set the expectation about the numbers that would be back from day one. Um, and that they would be low levels and we have been banking it up ever since which is what the recruitment's um, obviously um, adding to. Yeah. Hope that answered that. Thank you Alan. Um, Matt, did you have a point you wanted to make? Yeah, I just I wanted to come to come um, something about kind of volunteers in sort of income generating roles and involving volunteers in ways that um, essentially allow us to open our doors and start generating income and if we go back to when we set HVG up and we started having conversations sort of six years ago uh, now we were doing that against a background that's fairly similar to where we are today in terms of you know uh, sector was facing massive financial cuts um, and um, uh, you know volunteering um, we were very much kind of focused on volunteering you know, the idea of volunteering for well-being which you know is hugely important but I, I think we mustn't um, miss the fact that volunteers um, allow us to deliver more and operate differently and generate income and put us in a position where not only um, can we keep our doors open but our museums can thrive and what I wouldn't like us to do as volunteer managers is to be to be questioning whether or not involving volunteers in ways that um, help our organizations generate income I wouldn't like us to be thinking that that's not 
the right thing for volunteers to do because volunteers are giving their time freely which are conversations I've had and been involved in over the years you know I think if we have conversations with our volunteers that they want to volunteer with us because they believe in our organization and they support our organization and you know certainly if I go back to science museum group six years ago you know our volunteers were coming forward and saying you know we'll run this activity we'll run this activity as charge for things we want to help the organization survive we want to make sure that our paid colleagues that their jobs um, exist you know we want to do all we can and I just I, I would hate for us to be retreading those grounds and be concerned as volunteer managers about well, is it the right thing for us to be involved in volunteers you know when it, you know because the bottom line is money yes it absolutely is the right thing to do because you know if it isn't at the moment then there are questions about the future of our organizations and volunteers want to want our organizations to survive for the long term as much as we do so let's enable them to to do that in a way that's safe and secure yeah and just to chip in chip in on that i had a, a chap say to me the other day he's like oh he's like i don't really like this new role but um i really just want to do anything i can to help zsl at the moment mm -hmm. so I'll be coming in for now and then when you've got a few more numbers i'll take a bit of time off and you know what, that's absolutely the attitude. If our volunteers aren't sort of, um, so those that are able to obviously, but um, aren't able to come and support at this time, then to me, it would also beg the question around the purpose of volunteering within our organisations at a time when we are needing to, to be open and, um, you know, do it, doing what we do best. So yeah, absolutely. I would agree with what Matt was saying. Thank you, Rihanna and Matt. I think that's a really good point um, to come, come to, towards the end of this event with round the role of volunteers as we reopen. It's, um, it's going to be a big change for organisations in the next few years and volunteering is going to change as well as part of that and particularly in small organisations as well like my own where volunteers um, en enable the museum to actually open without them the museum would not be open in the public it allows the museum to be much more than it is and embeds it within the community and helps us develop an income through through museum shop for example and through through museum simply being open mm -hmm.